Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I am your host, Heather Tesco. I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is another episode thanks to Pen and Sword Press, thanks to the new biography on Cardinal Woolsey by Phil Roberts. It's the second of two parts because it was too much to cover in one episode. So if you didn't listen to the first part, the last episode, you should go do that now and I'll wait for you to come back. I'll still be here. So go do that and then come back. Um, And if you continue listening, then you will hear the second half of Cardinal Woolsey. And you should totally check out the biography. It was really great. I will have a link in the show notes, which I will put up as well. It's on my list to do. It will be at englandcast.com slash Woolsey, englandcast.com slash W-O-L-S-E-Y. I will um, get those links up there. But of course, this is the part where I talk to you about TudorCon. And I have a little note here, talk about TudorCon at this part, because TudorCon is really awesome. And I'm saying it now because it seems like it's a long way away. It's September 8th through 10th, 2023. It's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. We do it on the grounds of the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair. It's a a barn, a winery that's been, um, that's an old bank barn that they have weddings. It's a beautiful space. And, um, And it might seem like, you know, well, that's 10 months away, Heather. Why are you talking to me about TudorCon now? Well, I'll tell you why. (laughs) Because for to start with, time flies. And there's like this black hole that just reaches up and just like grabs time. And it does it more the older I get. And I'm really not happy with it. But there's that. So it will be here before you know it. But also because I do offer an installment payment plan. So if you want to get your ticket and you buy it now, you can spread that payment over a longer amount of time, right? Versus if you just get it in the summer then you will have less time to spread it out, uh, spread the payment out. So if you go to englandcast.com slash tutorcon, englandcast.com slash tutorcon, you'll see all the information. If you decide you want to come, just hit the buy now and a little button will pop up, brings up a shopping cart. And what you want to do to set up the payment plan is choose shop pay when you go to enter your payment details. And then that'll walk you through the approval and everything you need to do to um, set up the installment plan. So I'm really happy that I can offer that and make it easier for more people to come. I know times are weird. We're in really weird times right now, aren't we? And, you know, it's really hard because you see this stuff about recessions and the stock market and the this and the that and inflation and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, oh my gosh, do I really want to go to TudorCon? And you guys, I feel this planning it, right? And every year I think, do I really want the stress of doing this and being responsible for this? And then something happens on the weekend itself. And it's just such a magical time. And, and I say that because we're surrounded by people who all share the same passions that we have for Tudor history. And oftentimes, it's people who, you know, there's not necessarily other people in our life who get our passions. We all get together and we laugh at the same jokes and we all are, you know, excited to have the same kinds of conversations. And there's just something really special that comes out of that weekend. The group of people that come to this are the most special people in the world. Um, there are pe- people come from all over the country, even all over the world. And there are people who, who want to come hang out with a bunch of other history nerds and who want to you know, go to a new place, meet new people. And they're just so welcoming and so friendly. And it's just a really really magical time. And I don't say that lightly. Um, It really is. So if you are interested, englandcast.com slash TudorCon. Also, if you want to gift someone a TudorCon ticket for a holiday that is coming up, let me know. Send me an email after you get your ticket that it's a gift. And I will actually send a card to that person saying, hey, you're coming to TudorCon. Hooray. And we'll see you there. And then you can have that card under the tree or whatever holiday symbol you have, whatever you might put up to celebrate. Um, If you want to gift that for a holiday, let me know and I will send a card 
So there you go. That's my TudorCon story, englandcast.com slash TudorCon. There we are done. You have made it through. Congratulations. <laughs> Cardinal Woolsey. Last time we were talking about him, we talked about his upbringing, Ipswich when he was young, his relationship with his uncle's family, which helped inspire him to dream bigger, and his very, very fast rise in court. Woolsey was the dream administrator for Henry. He could handle anything from peace treaties to reforming monasteries to legal problems. He seemed to just be one of those kind of type A people who just thrives on stress. Though he did have some perpetual issues with his stomach, and that, of course, would come back to haunt him later, but there was nothing that kept him from his tasks. He was hardy enough to have survived the sweating sickness. He had several major viruses and regular bowel problems, but still he just soldiered on. Woolsey attracted Henry because he was capable, he was energetic. He had what we might term street smarts in that he often just sort of saw what needed doing and he did it. But Woolsey and Henry were also very similar. They would have meshed together in ways beyond just the professional. They were both very learned. They loved to be around people. They loved having these long meandering discussions about anything and everything. Plus, they had a pretty wicked shared sense of humor. Virgil wrote about Henry and Woolsey, saying that Woolsey would sing, smile, and tell jokes. He was a witty fellow who would cling to the royal side, strum the lute, dance, indulge in pleasant conversation, inculcate, instill, and drum into Henry's ears the things that he wanted him to hear. There are only two remaining letters of Henry's as king, but in them he called two people his true friends, Anne Boleyn and Woolsey. Of course, it's a little ironic considering he was the downfall of both of them too, but it does show how he felt about Woolsey. Henry and Woolsey started to cement their relationship when Henry wanted to go to war. When in doubt, go to war. The previous advisors, Richard Fox, Bishop of Winchester, and William Wareham, Archbishop of Canterbury, were both opposed to war in France, and they quickly fell from favor. But Woolsey saw an opportunity, and he took it to support Henry. The Pope, Pope Julius, also wanted war, feeling threatened by France. Henry saw this opportunity to restart the Hundred Years' War, and Woolsey supported him, bringing England into an alliance with the Pope, with the Holy Roman Emperor, and Henry's father-in-law, Ferdinand I, all of them against France. By 1515, Woolsey was the Lord Chancellor, which was the highest legal office in England. He was Lord Chancellor for 14 years, and during that time, he heard close to 9,000 cases. That's a lot. It seemed that Woolsey was able to do anything. Anything, that is, except get Henry a divorce. Things started to go downhill for Woolsey as early as 1525, when the King of France Francis I was captured by Charles V. Henry wanted to go to war with France and retake the French crown, something he felt the destiny had been driving him to do. To fund this whole excursion, Woolsey decided on a tax, the Amicable Grant. In an episode a couple of years ago, a long time ago, I talked about successful Tudor rebellions. And this was one. There were riots all over the place. And then the Spanish backed out of their previously made promises to help, and so the amicable grant was walked back. That June, Charles V formally ended his betrothal to Princess Mary, and then, in 1525, French ambassadors arrived in England to negotiate a peace. One of the discussion topics was a marriage with Mary, but these discussions were ended when a bishop questioned her legitimacy and whether the marriage between Catherine of Aragon and Prince Arthur had been consummated. In 1527, Henry agreed to give up the claim to the French throne in exchange for a yearly payment from France. They celebrated this whole thing with a joust, as you do, but the very same day, Charles V sacked Rome and took the Pope prisoner. And we all know how that boded for Henry's Uh, divorce desires. 
Later that summer, Woolsey left England to meet Francis and talk about a potential French bride for Henry in the wake of his growing marital problems and signed another peace treaty, still unaware that Henry really seriously wanted to marry Anne Boleyn at this point. When the announcement came that Henry did want to marry Anne, it surprised everyone, including Woolsey. But he started working as best as he could to secure the annulment from the Pope though the Pope was reluctant, of course, to anger Charles V, Catherine of Aragon's nephew. And we all know this story. In 1529, France signed a peace treaty with the Empire. They actually left England out of this treaty completely, something that made Woolsey look really bad to his boss. And Woolsey probably began to notice that Henry's feelings towards him were cooling by this point, and he was working doubly hard to try to secure the divorce. But Woolsey's problem was, one of his problems, was that he came to the realization about Henry's true intentions too late. On the world stage at this point, there was no box to fit Anne Boleyn into. She was something very different, and nobody could kind of figure out what to call her and where she went. Woolsey may have originally tried to put her in the box of a royal mistress, like that of Diane de Poitiers, who was the mistress to the French king, Henri II. As mistress, she had exceptional power, but she knew her limits and she never tried to marry the king. It was even possible to legitimize royal illegitimate children like Henry Fitzroy, to whom Wolsey was godfather. Fitzroy could even have been a potential heir if Edward hadn't been born. So Woolsey probably expected Anne to fit into the box of royal mistress, and when her true intentions became known, it likely caught everyone off guard. In 1527, Woolsey went to the Legantine court to have them examine the marriage. The trial was initially adjourned, then the Pope was captured by Spain, and Woolsey got pulled into trying to put out that fire and was sidelined from the marriage situation. Henry sent his private secretary, William Knight, to the Pope directly, carrying a document he hoped that the Pope would sign that Henry had made, stating that Henry was allowed to marry again, even if his first marriage wasn't annulled. Woolsey found out about this. We can only imagine how shocked and ticked he would have been. He tried to stop Knight's trip. Henry, realizing that he was found out, actually sent a letter to Knight himself, telling Knight to let Woolsey know that he, Henry, was pulling back on the plan. And then Knight said, yes, I'll go to Rome just to represent the Cardinal's plan. But Knight was all caught up in this mess because Henry now had another plan that he hadn't told Woolsey about. Woolsey tried to take back control, but of course Henry was impatient and continued to have Knight work for him on the down low. Woolsey failed on the divorce in part because he underestimated the women involved, thinking that Anne would be content to be a mistress and that Catherine wouldn't fight as hard for her rights as she did. When Woolsey's fall came, it came swiftly. By 1529, Henry didn't have his divorce. His status was falling internationally. He was left out of this peace treaty. So he allowed Woolsey to be charged with 34 charges of premunari, a law that made it an offense to allow a foreign authority to suppress the power of the king in England. This was originally a law from the 14th century designed to limit the power of the papacy in England. Wolsey still believed there was a way of saving himself, and he thought that he would likely plead guilty, listen to a lecture from Henry, and then get back into favor. Henry did pardon Wolsey in February of 1530, but it wasn't clear that he would be brought back into favor. In fact, the judgment was the logic for stripping Woolsey of his position of Lord Chancellor. Woolsey actually then gave over Hampton Court, his home near Richmond, to Henry, and Woolsey's enemies came out in force. Many of the people who had felt displaced by Woolsey, including Polydor Virgil, the Italian scholar and historian, and those in the church who resented his changes and the riches that he often received from them, there were also nobles. There were a lot of people that Woolsey had ticked off over the years. John Skelton, Henry's tutor, actually also disliked Woolsey. I did an episode a few years ago on him, and I talked about the time that he got in hot water for a poem that he wrote, asking in part, who was the most important and wealthiest man in England? Was it Henry 
or Woolsey. It includes the lines, Why come ye to court? To which court? To the king's court or to Hampton Court? Nah, to the king's court should have the excellence, but Hampton Court hath preeminence. Not so good. It also says, Ye are so puffed up with pride that no man may abide your high and lordly looks. Ye cast upon then your books, and virtue is forgotten. At this same time, Thomas Cromwell's star was rising, and Wolsey was dependent on his goodwill. Cromwell apparently spoke on his behalf and secured a gift of money for Wolsey. In February of 1530, Woolsey had received notice that he was to receive about £6,300 in money, goods, and chattel, which he was desperate for given that he had previously been stripped of everything he owned down to the small movable goods. Henry decided to let him keep the Archbishop of York position, but York Place, the London home of the Archbishops of York, would go to the Crown and become Whitehall Palace. Woolsey also gave up his income in St. Albans and Winchester, and the money would go back to the crown. He also gave up foreign money and pensions, and Henry also wanted to take back the colleges that he had founded, for example, in Ipswich. By springtime, Woolsey headed back up to York to take up his position of Archbishop of York. He left during Passion Week, spent Palm Sunday in Peterborough Abbey, where he carried palms in procession with the monks. On Maundy Thursday, he washed, wiped, and kissed the feet of 59 poor men. The 59 was meant to represent his age, and he also gave gifts out to them in alms. He spent his summer that year up in the northern part of the country. He was apparently in good cheer. He entertained, he feasted, and he moved around quite a bit during that summer of 1530, at one point receiving a delegation from the king to have him sign a petition to annul the marriage something that had been signed by all the clergy and nobility. On November 4th, 1530, Henry Percy, Earl of Northumberland, and Walter Walsh, groom of the king's privy chamber, arrived to arrest Woolsey for high treason. He was at dinner when they arrived, and Henry Percy first secured the castle and ordered the keys to be surrendered to him. He then went up a back passage so that no servants would see what was going on, and go and warn Woolsey. So apparently Woolsey was totally oblivious that Percy was there, and then from his reaction it seems that he was clueless as to what was actually going on. Woolsey greeted Percy familiarly, he even offered his own bedchamber for them to change out of their riding clothes. Then Percy said in a very low voice, My lord, I arrest you of high treason. Meanwhile, Woolsey's doctor, Augusto Augustini, had been kicked through the doorway out of the room. The cardinal clearly saw that the men were serious and that things were bad. The charge of high treason was a response to the belief that Woolsey was plotting against the king. First, he supposedly plotted with the French to encourage England to engage in a war against the emperor and the pope. Apparently, the witness to all of this was the said Dr. Augustini, who wasn't punished, despite the fact that he had apparently been part of all of the treasonous activities. So that's a bit suspicious. Or as my daughter likes to say, sus. She'd say, Mom, that sounds sus. And it does. Woolsey's trek down to London for trial was beginning. When he left his household, he thanked everyone who had served him, declaring that he was innocent. And crowds followed him, saying that they loved him. First he went to Pontefract, then Doncaster and Sheffield. At these stops, he was very happy to find that he was treated courteously and he took every opportunity to protest his innocence. In Sheffield, he began to feel a bit sick. As Cavendish notes, he broke exceedingly much wind upwards before heading off to prayer. Things got a bit worse for his tummy bug, and while he was literally on the toilet, word came that Sir William Kingston, constable of the tower, had arrived with 24 guards to escort him to London where he may try himself and his truth. Woolsey was weak. He'd been on the toilet almost constantly for a day, and a physician concluded that he was going to die within four or five days. But he had to press on to London, being so sick along the way that he nearly fell off his mule. He made it to Leicester Abbey on November 26th, welcomed by Abbot and Brethren. He went straight to bed, got worse. Monday morning, Cavendish, who was writing all of this, was convinced that he was dying. Woolsey was only in half-consciousness, asking what was going on and where he was. 
He continued to say that he had faithfully served the king. And this is also when he uttered his famous line about how if he had served God as diligently as he had Henry, God wouldn't have given him over in his gray hairs. The abbot gave him the final rites, and about 8 a.m. the next morning, he died. There's been a lot of speculation about what killed Woolsey in the end. You even see on TV the idea that maybe it was suicide or a murder. For the previous few months, though, he had complained of a thing that lieth across my breasts as cold as a wet stone. This, combined with his bowel and diarrhea issues, might lead to a diagnosis of cardiac failure. Add to that his worry and his stress, and it couldn't have been good for his body. The king ordered the body to be examined, and afterwards he was buried in a coffin with the vestigers of an archbishop. So we are going to leave it there this week. Remember, you can hop into the Tudor Learning Circle, which is tutorlearningcircle.com, to discuss this and all other things Tudor. It's a free social network just for Tudor history fans and enthusiasts. You can check out the biography by Phil Roberts, Cardinal Woolsey for King and Country. I will have a link again in the show notes, which I will put up. Englandcast.com slash Woolsey will be that link. Remember to grab your TudorCon ticket at Englandcast.com slash TudorCon and plan your magical trip to commune with your fellow Tudor history lovers in September of 2023. All right. I will talk with you again soon. Thanks so much for listening and we will speak soon. Send for maybe sweating, blow northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoot a board in Bowerbreak, that solely Sam Lee's on seat, men school maiden of me, fair and pretty. Later that summer, Woolsey left England to meet Francis and to talk about a potential French bride for Henry in the wake of his growing maritable. Maritable? marital problems. Let's do that again.